I wonder, what would it look like if God's will were really done on earth as it is in heaven, just like we pray every week? Perhaps we imagine that that would be a world free of pain and fear. Maybe war and crime and poverty would be unknown. Would people look out for one another? Would we still have arguments? Maybe we would, but if we did, rather than carrying them around with us for years or decades or lifetimes, maybe we'd be able to let them settle, to reconcile our differences. Our wish to see God's will done on earth as it is in heaven is, I think, as old as humanity. Scripture is the story of God bringing about that will. But it is also the story of a people who refuse to listen, who fall away, who make mistakes. That story is filled with people like Saul, who in their zeal to do God's will, actually find themselves working against it. It's filled with people like Peter, who really, really want to help and do what's right, but they fall short and ultimately end up denying God's way. As long as there have been people, God has been working to accomplish this will on earth as in heaven. And this is how far we've gotten. Some days it feels kind of hopeless, doesn't it? Most folks I talk to don't know what to make of the book of Revelation, but all you really need to know is this, that it is the story of how God's will is coming about even now. It helps maybe to take our reading and then back up a little bit for today to get some context. John sees um, on the throne of heaven God, worshipped by angels and 24 elders and four living creatures, and he sees God holding this scroll, sealed with seven seals, a divine decree announcing and ordering the will of God for all creation. In other words, announcing God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think at that moment, John's heart leaps. Finally, he says, after so much time and hardship and failure, God's will is about to come to fruition. But there's a problem. Because you see, whoever opens the scroll also has to enforce that will. They have to enact that will with the authority of God on earth. That's an awful lot of power, isn't it? Do you know anyone who could be unchanged by that kind of power? Can you imagine anybody on earth who could do that and do it well? I sure don't. And that's exactly the question that Revelation asks. As John watches, no one is found, not in heaven among the angels, not on the earth among disciples or rulers or anyone else, not even under the earth. In other words, the dead heroes of legend, people like Hercules or Perseus, None of them are found worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. In that moment, imagine that John feels lost. This close, he says. This close to seeing God's will done on earth as it is in heaven. But it cannot be. Creation will forever languish in warfare and oppression and corruption. That's the story of Scripture. Try as we might to accomplish God's will and live by God's word, we just cannot. We continue to fail, to make a mess of things. No creature, no human that has ever lived or ever will live, not even the angels in heaven, are worthy to open the scroll and break its seals and enact God's divine will on earth as it is in heaven because there is none in all of creation who is perfect like God. And so in that moment, John breaks down weeping. But then, but then, just as all hope seems lost, one of the elders around the throne turns to John and says, Do not weep. There is one who is worthy. 
the lion of the tribe of Judah. He has conquered. He is worthy to open the scroll. God's desire for creation, God's plan of salvation will come to pass after all. And there is one who can overcome or conquer, as John says, the evil of the world and all the misguided forces of humanity that stand in God's way. Now, for John and the congregations to whom he's writing, conquering evil means conquering Rome. That invincible empire that ruled the entire known world. Now, from where we're standing, history has since seen the fall of Rome and dozens of other empires like it. And yet, empire, with a capital E, empire as an idea as a power in the world, still remains. What does empire look like now? What powers in our world still stand in the way of God's will? There are certainly governments and laws that resist that will, but it's, that's not it. Our economy is built on greed and selfishness. Our political system is built on naive hopes and unfulfilled promises. Our whole way of life is built on using wealth and power and whatever else we can to get what we want with no thought to who or what we may be taking that from. Whoever would open the scroll must be powerful indeed to overcome all of that. Imagine what John must expect to see when he hears that the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered and will open the seal. Perhaps he imagines somebody who's powerful enough to defeat Rome with all of its legions of soldiers and its vast wealth. Might we also imagine someone who's able to conquer the nations of the earth? Or maybe a charismatic leader with a golden tongue who can win the hearts of people over to their cause. Or maybe someone rational and shrewd who can develop the perfect technology or the perfect system of government to end all of our problems forever. Because that's how humans think about power, right? We like power is symbolized by the lion. Nobody messes with a lion, except maybe a bigger lion. But this is the biggest lion of all. The strength of a lion is its power and the fear that it instills. Lions get what they need through violence and force. Lions destroy what opposes them. So what do you think goes through John's mind when he looks over to see this lion, and there in the midst of the elders, before the throne, stands this itty-bitty little lamb? A lamb that's been slaughtered has this gaping wound that's still weeping blood, but somehow it's still alive. How is that insignificant creature to conquer the forces of the world and eradicate evil? How can a lamb enforce God's will? And this one simple image, God, John turns our notions of power upside down. Because the lamb, of course, is Jesus the one who was slaughtered, the one being in all of creation who actually accomplished God's will. And he did it not by force, not by military power, political victory, but through love. Love even to the point of self-sacrifice. Here's the one being in all of creation who instead of taking, gave. In a world where we see power as something that must be exerted or enforced, God's message to us is that power lies not in bending the world to our own will, but in refusing to be bent by the weight of the world. As I dwell upon this image today, I wonder, John saw the Lamb and saw Jesus. In our own time, I wonder, If looking at that lamb, we might not see the church. Our church is wounded and bleeding. It's life slowly draining away. Maybe our first instinct is to force people, either by mandate or guilt, to come back, right? To try and obligate them by shaming them or withholding ministry. 
And when that doesn't work, maybe we want to try to lure people back by giving them what they want, whether it's new music or fancy programs or free food. Can you see how in our panic to save the church, we might end up abandoning the gospel altogether just to fill our sanctuaries? That's why none of us is worthy to open the scroll and to enact God's will in the world. And yet, it is through us, through the church, through that fatally wounded lamb, that God chooses to act. In the early days, the church didn't grow because of the music people sang or the sermons they preached. Didn't grow because of the witness of the martyrs or the sense of obligation that people had or how, to, uh, or how worship fit into their schedules. The church grew because of the love Christians had for one another and for the people around them. In a plague, when everybody else fled to the country, Christians were often the ones who stayed put and put themselves at risk to care for the sick and the dying. Instead of abusing slaves or ignoring the lower class like the rest of society, Christians welcomed these people, cared for them, ate with them, gave them their own possessions to make sure they had food and warmth. This is how, in spite of terrible persecution, the church grew in those first centuries after Christ. It was not overcome by the force and violence. It conquered with love, with the love of Jesus, the love of the Lamb. Violence begets violence. It can only bring death. But love, on the other hand, begets love and brings life. It's a vulnerable kind of power, isn't it? Vulnerable like a lamb, but that lamb has conquered because instead of seeking to save his own life, he gives his life in service to a greater cause, God's cause, the cause of love for all creation. There is no power on earth or in heaven which can overcome that kind of love that God has, because that love is what gives all creation form and existence and life. It is that love that is responsible for the eternal work of creation. I notice how in these readings today, it is this love that stops Saul on the road to Damascus and makes him a new man. It is this love that rolls back the threefold denial of Peter with a threefold profession of love, making him once again a disciple, a follower. It's this love that convinces Ananias, the man who healed Saul in Damascus, to overcome his fear and doubt and to lay his hands on a man who would kill him, opening the way for the gospel to spread in new and unimagined ways. This is the love that conquers. In John's vision, the Lamb is worthy to open the scroll, to proclaim and bring about God's will on earth as it is in heaven. And the response to that realization is wild elation, the reading that we read today. The eternal and constant praise of these mysterious winged creatures and the elders around the throne takes on new energy as the voices of all creation, all creatures on the earth and under the earth and in the sea, Join in the song of praise. To the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Can you imagine the excitement John must feel as the love of God embodied in the Lamb begins making everything new? I cannot read this story and believe that this is only a promise for some far-off future. The story has power not because it will be true, but because it is true. And so I wonder as I read this, how is God making the world new, even now? Where is the old world that we've always known coming to an end? And where is something new sprouting? 
Where is God at work among us now? How is God remaking the church in these days? And how is that church being called to follow the slaughtered yet living lamb into the next chapter? What does this love ask of us? And what does it offer us? Not just as individuals, but as a community of disciples. Where is that love taking us? Whatever the answers to those questions, I imagine that the road ahead will be hard. Saul spent as much time in the dark as Jesus did in the tomb. Peter was grieved by Jesus' questioning, but ultimately healed by that questioning. For us, too, there will be pain and grief and death. But I have to imagine that for people like Peter or Saul or I suspect anyone who follows the Lamb, a little bit of death isn't enough to stop us.